in John's Gospel, the 13th chapter, at the 13th verse. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. And then again in Matthew, the 6th chapter, in the 24th verse, these words. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and man. Here is Christ saying to the people of his day, I am your Lord. I am your master. I want to be in control of your life. Now, what right did Jesus Christ have to come to me as a young person or you as a young person and say, I want to take over your life. I want to control you. Who is he that makes such a demand upon us in 1957? He says, I want to control your life. What right is he to come up to me and say to me, I want your allegiance. I want your loyalty. I want your faithfulness. I want you to surrender everything you've got to me. Who is this Christ? H.G. Wells once said, Christ is the most unique person of history. No man can write a history of the human race without giving first and foremost place to a penniless teacher of Nazareth. Napoleon once said, I know men, and I tell you, Jesus is not a man. Comparison is impossible between him and any other being that has ever lived. Who is this person that has done more to transform history than any man that ever lived? He lived only 33 years. He only traveled a hundred miles at the most in one poor little section of the world called Palestine. And yet he transformed civilization. And after 2,000 years tonight, millions follow him. And he stands here tonight in this garden and says to the young people of New York, follow me, serve me, live for me. I can change your life. I can transform you. I can make you a new person. Now, if he just stood here and said that, if Jesus out of his word and through his messenger just said that and couldn't perform, I wouldn't follow him. I wouldn't believe in him. But not only does he say it, not only does he demand it, but he does it. You heard these testimonies a moment ago. We could bring hundreds in this audience to this platform tonight and tell you how Christ has changed their lives. He lives today. He can take a young kid that's having a rough time in school and in the gangs and all the rest like Larry Doyle and change him, transform him, make him a new person. He can do the same for you if you're willing to give your allegiance to him. He is the one that is the son of the living God. Jesus Christ is not just an ordinary man. He's not a man like Lenin that demands followers today. He's not a man like Buddha. He's not a man like Muhammad. Jesus Christ is unique in history because Jesus Christ was God. The Bible tells us that it was God breaking into human history Christ coming and becoming a man and then dying on the cross for sin. And the thing that makes Christianity different from all the other religions of the world is that we have a Savior who died on the cross and shed his blood for your sins. Now the Bible tells you and almost all the religions tell you that you're a sinner. We all know we're sinners. Our conscience tells us we're sinners. We've broken God's law. We've broken the law of conscience. We've broken the law of the Ten Commandments. We've broken every conceivable moral law. We're all guilty. We're all sinners. And the Bible tells us that as a result, judgment is going to fall upon us. And that judgment is death, separation from God, separation from the living God forever. Now, Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, taking our sins in his body on the tree. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us on that cross. But after they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb, on the third day he rose again. And tonight, I do not ask you young people to follow a dead Christ. I don't ask you young people to go to a Syrian grave and see some bones and believe that he can change your life. I call you tonight to follow a living Christ. 
I call you tonight to a living Savior that has been raised from the dead, that lives at the right hand of God the Father. Yes, Jesus Christ lives, and he has tremendous influence in the world today, in art, in culture, in freedom. He freed the slaves. He brought women to the place that they are in the world today. And every woman here tonight should give their allegiance and their loyalty and their thanksgiving to Jesus Christ. Every labor union, every person that's a member of the labor union, and all the advantages that you have of a labor union, you should give your life to Jesus Christ because it was Christ in the great revivals of the 17th century that started the great organized labor movements that were founded by and large in great spiritual revivals. It was Jesus that brought the advantages that we have in the world today. Hospitals, orphanages, colleges, universities, many of them having their roots in Jesus Christ. And he has power to change lives today. He can change your life. He can touch your life tonight. He is the master. He's the Lord. He created you. He bought you on the cross. He paid the price of your redemption. And he says tonight, I want to be master. I want to be Lord of your life. This is the Christ that demands your undivided attention. And all the way through the scriptures, we are taught that he must be Lord. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Bible again says, wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. He has a name that is above every name in the universe. He is Lord of lords and King of kings. He called you to his standard. He called you to march in his army. He says, I'm going out to conquer a world. I'm going out to conquer a universe and I want you with me. He's asking you to give your loyalty to him, to give your life to him. What does he demand that he be master of? Five things I want to mention tonight he wants to be master of in your life. First, he wants to be master of your mind. There's a great deal in the Bible to say about the mind. Christ said, we are to love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. The Bible again says in Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together. Now the Bible has a great deal to say about your mind and your reasoning processes. But you know what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches that nobody can come to know Christ through the mind alone. Not a person. The world by wisdom knew not God. There is no one that can rationalize his way to Christ. Why? Because the Bible teaches that our minds are fallen. The Bible teaches that when man sinned, their minds became darkened. The devil put a blindfold over the mind and misdirected the mind. 2 Corinthians 3.14 says their minds were hardened. A veil lies over their minds. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Ephesians 4.17, in the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Oh, yes. Ph.D. professors, professors in chemistry, great atomic scientists, men with brilliant minds, when it comes to spiritual things, they're blind. There's a veil over their minds. They cannot understand spiritual things. They cannot make it out. Now, the moment you receive Christ, God says, let there be light. And the light of God will break upon your mind as you yield your mind to Christ. And after you come to Christ, he wants to be Lord of your mind. And when you come and receive Christ, he wants to be Lord of your reasoning processes. And Paul said, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Your mind, your reasoning processes brought to the cross and given to Christ until you think only the thoughts that Christ would have you think. Discipline your mind. 
And don't ever let anything come into your body such as drink or narcotics that dull your thinking. Keep them out. They have no part in a Christian. Keep your mind on Christ. The scripture says thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. When you wake up in the morning, your first thoughts should be about Christ, about God. The moment you wake up, get your mind on him. Keep it on him in the subconscious during the day. Learn some scripture verses that you can repeat over and over during the day. Read a passage in the scripture before you go out in the morning. Let your mind be saturated with the things of God, and I guarantee you during the day, he will direct your mind. He wants to be the master of your mind. Secondly, he wants to be the master of your body. The scripture says Christ is the Savior of the body. And in Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 1 Corinthians six twenty says, Ye are not your own. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians nine twenty seven says, I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. Paul said, You see this body of mine? I have brought it to the cross and I've given it to Jesus Christ and I keep it under discipline. The Bible says our eyes. Have you ever taken your eyes that the Bible says are haughty and covetous and lustful? Have you ever taken them and said, Oh Lord, I give them to thee so that they'll look upon the things that thou wouldst have me look upon? Have you ever taken your ears that the Bible says are disobedient, dull of hearing and stopped up, spiritually speaking, and dedicated them to God? Have you ever taken your mouth that the Bible says is boastful and deceitful and speaks evil and given it to Christ? Have you ever taken your tongue that the Bible says that the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature, and it's set on fire of hell? Have you ever taken this little thing in your mouth, this little piece of red muscle called the tongue and given it to God? Have you ever taken your hands that the Bible says are unclean, the hands that do evil, the hands that hurt so many people, and say, Lord, take my hands and nail them to thy cross. Have you ever taken your feet that the Bible says are so swift to mischief in Proverbs 6, 18? Have you ever taken these feet of yours and said, Oh God, help them to take me only to the places that thou wouldst have me to go? Take your whole body. Yield it to Christ. And if you're not willing to give your body to him and not willing to give your mind to him, he cannot receive you. He must be master of all. And then thirdly, he wants to be master of your social life, the kind of friends you have. What kind of friends do you have? Oh, some of you have come to give your life to Christ. You have some new friends now, thousands of them in this city that love Christ that you can become acquainted with. They'll become closer to you than your blood relatives. The friends in the church, that's the reason we need the fellowship of the church. Friends to help us to grow fellowship. And some of you are going to have to cut loose from some of the old gang. Oh, you don't have to go out and worry about it. They'll cut loose from you if you start living for Christ. You claim to give your life to Christ. All right, let's see if it sticks. And if it sticks, they are going to respect you. And after a while, you are going to be the number one person that they look to when they need help. But if you fall one time or if you compromise one place, you're done for. They'll laugh at religion and you've brought the name of Christ in disrepute and you've hurt the testimony of Christ in your school and in your gang. And then amusements, the type of amusement you go to, the type of things you read and see. I always ask myself three things. Can I ask God's blessing on this thing I'm about to do? Secondly, is it to the glory of God? Do all things to the glory of God, the Scripture says. And then ask yourself the third thing, will it be a stumbling block? If somebody sees me there, will it make a weaker brother stumble? 
He wants to be master of your talents and your possessions. Every one of you have abilities and talents that you can give to Christ. God may want some of you on the mission field. Some of you could be pastors and teachers in service for Christ. You have talents that God wants and God wants to use them. The scripture says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God says, I'm searching for a young man in 1957, a young woman that'll pay the price, that'll make me Lord and Master, that I can use in Africa, in Asia, in South America, a young man or a young woman that I can use in the areas of New York that desperately need Christ. But God says, I can't find anybody that'll sell out to me. I can't find anybody that'll make me master, that'll give their talents to me. You say you have nothing to offer? You say that there's little or nothing you can bring to Christ? You're wrong. You have a heart with which you can love him. You have a life with which you can serve him. You have gifts and talents that you can consecrate to him. You have an influence of others that you can exert on his behalf. And so tonight, I ask you, bring him your personality, your powers of mind and memory and reason and will and imagination and feeling, all your capacity for devotion and loyalty and endurance and service. It may be tarnished and undeveloped, but that personality of yours is something Christ can use. Secondly, bring him your individuality. There is no one in all the world quite the same as you. There's a place in the kingdom of God that no one else can occupy, a niche of service that only you can fill. I couldn't fill it. The greatest minister in town couldn't do what you can do. Give your life to Christ and your talents to him and bring your individuality. Bring him your influence. For better or worse, your life is telling on the lives of others. The atmosphere of your neighborhood can be a little cleaner a little sweeter, a little brighter, and a little more wholesome because of you living a clean, wholesome, dedicated life to Christ. And above all, bring him what you still have, the years that lie in front of you. For years, science waged a battle against yellow fever. At last, they tracked down the little mosquito, but they were not sure. And they called for volunteers, and two healthy young men came and said, we'll give ourselves. They said, there's a big reward. They said, we won't take the reward, but we give ourselves. They were bitten by the mosquito. They were isolated. They had fever. But eventually they were saved. What did these fellows have to offer to science? They didn't have the brain of an investigator or the skill of a research worker. They didn't have the wealth of John D. Rockefeller to put in a big foundation. But they had two strong, healthy bodies, and they gave these to the cause of science. Tonight, you may not have the ability to sing like Beverly Shea. You may not be able to do some of the other things that others can do, but you have a body that you can present to Christ, and there are hidden, latent talents that God can use if you'll come and bring them to him. He may not want you to be a preacher. He may want you to be a businessman in this town standing up for him. He may want you to be a Christian lawyer. He may want you to be a Christian banker. He may want you to be a Christian housewife. He may want you in a thousand other positions. He needs his witnesses in this city. I'm asking you young people to say, I'll turn loose. I'll give everything I have to Christ. Will you do it? Paul said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I'm asking you to ask the same question. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I'm ready to go. I'm ready to stay. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to live. I'll make you Lord and Master of my life. And then lastly, he wants to be the master of your heart. Revelation 6.10, O master, the holy and the true. That word means absolute authority. He wants to capture your will. He wants to be the sovereign of the soul. He wants your heart, and when he has your heart, he'll have you. And when you give him your old heart with its evil tendencies, He'll give you a new heart in its place. And you've been going in this direction in your life. He'll turn you around and start you in a new direction. I'm asking you to renounce your sins and come to the cross and ask his forgiveness and cleansing and receive him to be born again, to be changed. That's the starting point. Then comes the days, the months, the years that you walk with Christ and live for him, adjusting 
all the time, and maybe someday in this country, as in other countries, there will come persecution. And you may have to be persecuted for your faith in Christ. You may have to be persecuted in New York for taking your stand for Christ. But you're ready to accept the challenge. You're ready to follow Christ. You're ready to make him master and lord of your life. Will you? If you will, I'm going to ask you to start tonight and say, Oh God, tonight holding back nothing, I give myself to thee as Lord and Master and Savior. I want to come and take my stand at the cross and start on a new road in a new direction. I want a new heart and a new life. I'm going to ask all of you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you. Get up out of your seat and come and stand right here in front, quietly and reverently with bowed heads. And say, by coming, I give my life to Christ as Lord and Master.